Hi everyone, this is the first video of a series of cardiovascular videos that I'll be doing. Today we're going to focus on the structures of the heart, so let's go ahead and get started. Let's start off with the four chambers of the heart. Chambers are pretty much like little rooms, and we have your two atria at the top. Atria is plural and atrium is singular, and we have your two ventricles on the bottom. Now, we have your right atrium on the right side of the heart and your left atrium on your left side of the heart. We have your right ventricle on the right side of the heart and your left ventricle on the left side of the heart. So next we have our valves. We have four important valves in the heart. Two of them are called your semilunar valves and the other two are called your atrial ventricular valve. Your semilunar valves include your pulmonary valve and your aortic valve. Your pulmonary valve is what separates your right ventricle from your pulmonary trunk that leads to your lungs. And your aortic valve is what separates your left ventricle from your aorta. So these valves are made of three cusps on each of them and they kind of resemble a half moon or a semilunar moon and that's why they're called semilunar valves. Next we have our atrial ventricular valves. They're called atrial ventricular because these valves separate the atrium from the ventricles. So you'll find your right atrial ventricular valve on the right side of the heart and the left atrial ventricular valve on the left side of the heart. Our right atrial ventricular or AV valve for short is also called the tricuspid valve because it has three cusps that create this valve. So this tricuspid valve separates your right atrium from your right ventricle. It allows blood to flow from the right atrium and into the right ventricle, and it prevents backflow of blood from your right, right ventricle to go back into your right atrium. On the left side of the heart, we have our left atrial ventricular valve. This is also called the bicuspid valve. Bi meaning two, so this means we have two cusps here. This is also called the mitral valve. Depending on what school you go to or where your workplace is, they might call it bicuspid or mitral valve. This valve separates the left atrium from the left ventricle and it allows blood to flow from the left atrium downwards into the left ventricle and it prevents backflow of blood from the left ventricle to the left atrium. So basically all four of your valves are going to do these two things. They are going, they're all one way valves. So they're all gonna allow blood to flow in one direction and they're going to close and prevent backflow of blood to, from going in the wrong direction. Let's do a little recap here. So remember we have four chambers in the heart. We have your two atrium at the top and your two ventricles at the bottom. Your right atrium is on the right side of the heart and your left atrium is on the left side of the heart. We have your right ventricle on the right side of the heart and your left ventricle on the left side of the heart. We have your semilunar valves which include your pulmonary valve and your pulmonary valve separates your right ventricle from your pulmonic trunk and your lungs. And then we have your aortic valve. Your aortic valve separates your left ventricle from your aorta. And then we have our two AV valves, AV for atrial ventricular because they separate the atrium and the ventricles. On the right side, we have our right AV valve, also known as the tricuspid valve, and it separates the right atrium and the right ventricle. On the left, we have our left AV valve, and that's also known as the bicuspid valve or the mitral valve, and this separates your left atrium from your left ventricle. So here we have this large blood vessel that brings blood that is low in oxygen to the heart. Specifically, it brings it to the right atrium. So we have on the top the superior vena cava, and this brings blood from the head of the body and the upper extremities. Then we have our inferior vena cava. This brings blood from the lower extremities and the trunk of the body. So again, when blood that is low in oxygen or you may call it also deoxygenated blood, comes in from the vena cava, it gets dumped into the right atrium. So the right atrium is the first uh, spot that the blood is going to be received in. Now the right atrium has a few 
very important structures starting with this little opening right here this is called the coronary sinus the coronary sinus brings deoxygenated blood to the right atrium as well however this blood doesn't come from the entire body it actually comes from the heart itself specifically the myocardium the myocardium is the heart muscle so the coronary sinus is part of the coronary system which is the system that supplies blood to the heart so that the heart can function but we'll talk about that more later the next important structure is here in the right atrium it's this small depression of scar tissue and it's known as the fossa ovalis the fossa ovalis is a remnant of scar tissue from a hole that was once there. So basically, when you were a fetus, you had a hole between your right and left atrium. This hole was known as the foramen ovale. Now, as you grew up and you developed and you began to grow, it started to close. And when it closed, it left scar tissue. This scar tissue is known as the fossa ovalis. Next, we have our pulmonary veins. Our pulmonary veins bring oxygenated blood from the lungs and drop it right into the left atrium. So on the left side of the heart, we have our left pulmonary veins and those bring oxygenated blood from the left, uh, from the left lung. And on the right side of the heart, we have the right pulmonary veins. These bring oxygenated blood from the right lung and both of them drop blood right into the left atrium. The next structure is the pulmonary trunk. The pulmonary trunk comes right after the pulmonary valve and before the lungs. So it pretty much is the extension or the bridge from the right ventricle to the lungs. So the way I've drawn it here isn't exactly the way it looks. I just drew it like this to save some space. So on this other page, I'm going to draw more what the pulmonary trunk looks like. So here, let's just pretend this is the pulmonary valve. And when we pass through the pulmonary valve, we enter the pulmonary trunk. Now, this pulmonary trunk actually branches off to a right side and a left side. It branches out to the right pulmonary artery on the right side of the body and branches out to the left pulmonary artery on the left side of the body. Your right pulmonary artery is going to take blood to your right lung, while your left pulmonary artery is going to take blood to your left lung. And remember that this blood is deoxygenated. It has very low oxygen in it, and it's going to the lungs to pick up oxygen and also exchange and drop off CO2 because that's another thing that the circulatory system does, is it drops off CO2 in our lungs so our lungs could exhale it and get rid of it because we don't want too much CO2 in our body. And in exchange, it takes oxygen that we do need in our body. Next, we have our aorta. It's also a huge vessel, just like the pulmonary trunk. So. Our aorta goes right after the aortic valve. And remember the aortic valve is what separates your left ventricle from your aorta. So just like the pulmonary trunk, I didn't really have too much room to draw a proper aorta here on this paper. So I'm going to do a more detailed aorta on this separate paper on the right. So starting off with a aortic valve, um, this is what leads the oxygenated blood to the aorta and from the aorta it goes out to the entire body. There is a specific special region in the aorta called the aortic arch and that's pretty much at the arch, this arch area. And what's so special and specific about it is that it has 
three extending arteries. These extending arteries are what take blood into the upper portions of the body. So the head, the upper extremities of the body. We'll get back to these arteries and their names a little bit later. But another part of the aorta that is a specific important region is called the descending aorta. So descending aorta is this long a strip right here and it basically takes the blood to the lower extremities and the trunk of the body so your two major regions your aortic arch this is where you have your arteries that take the blood to your upper extremities and upper body and then your descending aorta takes all your blood to your lower body Okay, so back to these branches off of the aortic arch. So if the blood is coming directly from the aortic valve, the first branch that it's going to hit is the brachiocephalic trunk. Secondly, it's going to hit the common corroded arteries. And lastly, it's going to hit the subclavian arteries. Now, these are super important, but I'm not going to go into the detail about them in this video, but probably in another cardiovascular vi uh, video. Okay, so just to recap here, we have two major arteries in our heart, the aorta and the pulmonary trunk that we just went over. Pulmonary trunk is going to take your deoxygenated blood to your lungs, while your aorta is going to take your oxygenated blood to your body. So let's go ahead and take a step back and talk about these valves again. So the AV valve, remember atrial ventricular valve, we have two of them, the tricuspid valve and the bicuspid or mitral valve. So these AV valves have something special about them. Each AV valve has this collagen cord that's called a coordinate tendine. And these coordinate tendine basically anchor the valves to the muscle of the heart. They keep them in place. And the coordinate tendine cannot work alone. They actually need the help of papillary muscles. Papillary muscles attach to every single coordinate tendine and they basically keep them tight and taut. So the coordinate tendine and the papillary muscles work together to keep the valves from collapsing because if they collapse, then there's going to be something called regurgitation. Regurgitation is when the blood goes in the opposite direction, the direction it's not supposed to go in. And this ultimately can cause problems like, you know, it can pull in one of the chambers and the oxygenated and deoxygenated blood can be mixed. So it can lead to complications. One extra little thing is that when we have a myocardial infarction or a heart attack, it affects the muscles in the heart. It actually causes ischemia in the heart. Ischemia is when the tissue, the muscle tissue, it pretty much goes dead and it goes weak. So the papillary muscles are included. They can become ischemic. So if they're ischemic, they're going to become weak. And if they're weak, it's going to ultimately affect the coordinate tendine, which is going to affect the valves. And the valves are going to collapse. Everything you see here that I'm drawing in pink represents the myocardium or the heart muscle. So this surrounds the entire heart and the first region that is really important to know is the interventricular septum. So interventricular septum separates the right ventricle from the left ventricle. You also have a interatrial septum, but it is far less common or important to know this one, but basically it does the same thing. It's a septum and it separates the right and left atrium. So interventricular and interatrial septums. Now, another important thing to know about this myocardium is that in the ventricles, it becomes thicker. So in the atria, the myocardium is somewhat thin or relatively thin, but once you come to the ventricles, it gets thicker and thicker. And this is because the ventricles have to pump the blood into such a far distance the right ventricle has to pump the blood to the lungs while the left ventricle has to pump the blood all throughout the body all the way to the tip of your toes so the left ventricle is actually known to be even thicker than the right right ventricle so left ventricle has the thickest part of heart muscle or myocardium 
So we've pretty much gone over all of the important structures that are within the heart. So let's go ahead and look at the heart wall and its layers. On the left hand side, I have drawn out the left side of the heart. So it includes the left atrium and the left ventricle. And you can see blood has filled up the left ventricle. And on the right hand side, I pretty much have a drawing of a, of a cut out piece of the heart wall. So first off, the heart wall has three layers. The innermost layer is the endocardium, the middle layer is the myocardium, and the outermost layer is the epicardium. The endocardium, the innermost layer, this is the layer that actually touches the blood that is within the heart. It's a thin, smooth layer of epithelial cells, and it also extends to the membranes that cover the flaps of the heart valves. The myocardium is the thickest layer, and it's a heart muscle. It pumps the blood through the vessels. The epicardium is the outermost layer, and it is a serous membrane that forms a thin layer that surrounds the heart wall. So we also have this thing called the pericardium or the pericardial sac. And I think the sac best describes it because it's pretty much like a bag that encloses the heart and its wall and keeps it safe. So this pericardial sac or pericardium consists of a few layers. The innermost layer is called the visceral pericardium. And it just happens to overlap and enclose the epicardium so it pretty much is the same layer of, as the epicardium so you can refer to the epi epicardium as the epicardium or the visceral pericardium following this visceral pericardium or epicardium is this space or cavity that has serous fluid inside of it the whole point of the fluid and the space here is to prevent friction from the two layers that surround it when the heart is contracting. So this space is called the pericardial cavity. Following the pericardial cavity, we have the parietal pericardium. This layer encloses the visceral layer and protects it. Lastly, following the parietal pericardium is the final layer of the pericardial sac. This is the fibrous pericardium. So this fibrous pericardium is connective tissue that anchors this pericardial layer to the diaphragm, the sternum, and the surrounding structures of the heart. So basically, this layer holds the heart in place. Okay, one last thing I want to add here is that when we're speaking of the pericardium, oftentimes we talk about two layers of the pericardium. So the two layers of the pericardium is the serous pericardium and the fibrous pericardium. So the fibrous pericardium is just that it's the fibrous uh, pericardium that layer but the serous pericardium includes everything else so it includes the parietal pericardium the pericardial cavity and the visceral pericardium so just keep that in mind that the pericardium is often referred to or known to have two layers and that is the vis i mean sorry not the visceral the serous pericardium and the fibrous pericardium Alrighty everyone, we're done with all of the structures of the heart. In my next video, we're going to go over the blood flow of the heart and in other words, the cardiac cycle. As you can see here, we're going to separate the pulmonary circuit and the systemic circuit as well as going over the electrical conduction system, which is the system that initiates the heartbeat as well as the coronary system. The coronary system is the blood supply to the heart. So I'll probably be uploading that within the next week. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, please give me a thumbs up and any feedback is appreciated. And thank you so much for being here. Happy studies, everyone.